Dear people of God, this morning we look at a time when Israel went ballistic. We read uh, Judges 2, 6 to 23, and a key verse in that passage says, Then Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. You know, there is behind that text a whole context, a whole different way of life, a whole history. I'm going to probe that a little bit. Just to see the relevance of this passage for today, uh, here's an important question. Where do babies come from? You know, for a while, there was a popular story that got told in, in houses, in families that the stork brought the babies. Uh, maybe people were too embarrassed to talk about human reproduction and where children really come from and to tell the true story to their children. And because that topic in those days was a bit taboo, there was the invention of the mythology of the stork. And the stork would bring the baby and the stork would drop that baby down the chimney how they got through that chimney sparkling clean and so uh, beautiful and unscratched. Um, I guess nobody really bothered to ask. But anyway, the stork brought the baby. Well, thankfully, nowadays, parents, I don't think, tell their kids that anymore. Parents are more open, uh, more transparent with their children in terms of where babies come from. But you know, even before this history of the stork brings the baby, there was another popular myth about where children come from, where babies come from. Uh, in the land of Canaan, where the Philistines and other Canaanites lived, the story was told that the babies came from Baal, that the god Baal had something to do with the birth of the children. This, this god Baal was supposed to be the god of the seasons, the god of fertility, the god of reproduction. I'm going to see a little bit more about that this morning and what that implies. That's a, a myth that's probably older than the myth of the stork. This morning, as the people of God, we have seen the baptism of Colton, and we're reminded that this baby, this, this Colton, doesn't come from the stork and has nothing to do with Baal. But there's a gracious God, a God of the covenant, the one true God who loves us profoundly and, and brings gifts and treasures into our lives and has gifted Brandon and Keisha with this child and trusted them with a responsibility to train him and given all of us collectively a responsibility together. And it's important that we're reminded of that because there's a subtle pressure to adapt to surrounding culture and religious ideas. We live in Canada. We live in a certain context in the year 2015 and there are pressures in this world and there are things that are being taught in this world. There are untruths that are being presented in our world today. They're in the education system. They're in the media. They're in the culture. They're all, they're all around us. And our challenge today, people of God, is not all that different from the challenge that the Israelites faced after the passing away of Joshua, after they were into the land and there were pockets of people all around them that didn't believe a thing of what they believed. They didn't believe in the one true God, the God of the covenant. They didn't put their trust in the God who had brought his people out of the land of Egypt and into this land and given them the land as an inheritance. They had their own religion. They had their own culture. They had their own way of living in the land. Israel, the people of Israel, the children of Israel were put under immense pressure to compromise and to start to look like the people of the land and to worship like the people of the land and to believe the, the way the people of the land worship. They were, they were put under immense pressure and there were times when they capitulated 
and they started acting like Canaanites rather than Israelites. And people of God, the challenge for us today, living in our culture and in our context, is really not all that different. The pressure is on us. Day by day, week by week, year after year, decade to decade, to start to look more and more like a secular people in a world that perhaps doesn't totally deny the existence of God, but really denies the personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's really what this message is about. You see, the Israelites lived in the context of the Canaanite culture and religion. And the verse that we read said they started to do what the Canaanites did. They believed in Baal and the cycle of the seasons in Canaanite religion. And now you ask, well, how did that work? Well, Baal was considered the storm god. And according to the Canaanite religion, uh, every year the seasons went in a cycle. No surprise there. We know that seasons are cyclical. But they believed that there was a time when death seemed to be ruling. And the crops would die off and wouldn't grow. And there wouldn't be any rain in the land. The land would lie dry. And they believed that in that time period, Baal, the god Baal, who was one of their chief gods, the god Baal had gone down into the realm of death, had descended there to the realm of death and was doing battle with other gods. And then, in their belief, Baal was victorious, and and Baal would triumph, and then the rains would come, and thunder would flash, and the uh, thunder would crash, and lightning would flash in the skies, and and the water would pour down out of the clouds, and it would fill the furrows, and, and things would start to grow again. There was a new season, there was new life, and they would, they would go to the temples. And they would celebrate the victory of Baal. And the victory that brought spring and the new season and the hope of a new harvest and an opportunity to give thanks to Baal for the cycle of life. This Baal, they believed, was the god of fertility. This Baal was the one who uh, brought reproduction for their animals and also human reproduction. Now, in the worship of Baal, there were some aspects and elements that, in God's eyes, were horrific, were abominable. First of all, he was an idol god. This this was not the creator of heaven and earth. This was not the God who had formed Adam and Eve out of the dust of the earth and breathed into their their nostrils the breath of life. This is not the God who created and provided for the world. And when the people came to worship this God Baal, typically in the Canaanite scene, At certain seasons of the year with the celebration of fertility and the fertility cult, that worship at the temple of Baal also included religious prostitution, an enactment, a dramatic enactment of what they hoped to see in terms of fertility in animals and crops and people. And there's some evidence that also that worship of Baal uh, included child sacrifice. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean all the time that one of the children would actually be taken and put on the altar and sacrificed in that way in the altar. But there is evidence, there is evidence that in that ancient religion, children were sent out alone and left to die in the wilderness as an offering to Baal. There were horrific aspects to that religion, inhumane aspects to that religion. And and God says, it's detestable to me. So now we ask this question, how in the world, how in the world is it conceivable that people were attracted to that kind of worship? Well, Israel, in the context of of their Canaanite culture and religion, 
uh, we're told, were a second generation in the land. They lived in that land, and they, they were a generation that had not experienced firsthand the power of the Lord God Almighty. They were not there when um, Israel came out of Egypt. They were not there to cross through uh, the Red Sea. They were not there to stand at the, at the Mount Sinai when God touched the mountain and when God spoke and God gave. They were not there when Jericho, the walls of Jericho fell. They were not there when the people of Ai were defeated. This, this was another generation. Another generation that hadn't experienced firsthand the power of God. And somehow the one generation to the next had failed to pass on the truth of how to worship the one true God. And so they were influenced by the people around them. We're told that they really watched the neighbors next door. They were surrounded by their neighbors. And, and when Judges 2 is talking about the neighbors of Israel, it's not talking about the, the nations that were the neighbors of Israel. It's not Egypt to the south and um, Syria to the north and Assyria and Babylon over there around the corner and then way out to the east. Those are not the neighbors that they were talking about. They were talking about people that were left in the land. You see, when, when Joshua led the people of Israel into the land of promise. God gave various cities and regions into the control of the Israelites. But the Bible makes it very clear, not all of the Canaanites, not all of the Philistines and other people who were living in the land were eliminated. They, there were whole pockets of them or even cities of those people that were still living there. So the Israelites were in the land but they had Canaanite neighbors living next door. And they watched over the fence. They talked to their neighbor in the backyard and they saw how these Canaanites ran their agricultural processes and that kind of stuff. And, and you can imagine how those conversations kind of went. Well, if you want to have a good crop, if you want to do well, if you, if you want your harvest to be blessed, you need to go to Baal. You need to go to the temple. You need to worship there. You need to pray for your crops, and, and you need to live that way in the land. And the Israelites gradually capitulated. They said, if that's what it takes to be prosperous, if that's what it takes to be happy, if that's what it takes to, to do well and to be wealthy in this land, then that's what we'll do. And for a while, they probably did both. They worshiped their God and they worshiped the other gods. You've got to cover all of your bases. You can never be too sure. you just got to, you got to live in the land and do what it takes in the land to be like the people of the land because these people have been here for a long time. So they were influenced by their neighbors next door. People of God, we are called to be a Christian community in today's society. And no, we don't have Canaanites living around us. We have Canadians living around us. And we have people of all different ethnic backgrounds. And we live in a pluralistic society. We have people from all different religions. And many people who on their census form would just check the box that say no religion. They don't believe anything or they believe a bit of everything. That's the culture in which we live. We live in a culture in which... There are many very educated, influential leaders that believe that you have to have a completely open mind and you can believe whatever you want. We live in a Canadian culture in which many of our leaders believe that it's very narrow-minded, very small-minded to believe that there is one true God, that it's offensive to believe that Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. We live in a culture in which many people believe that, well, this, this business about a worship of a personal God, a God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for sin in the world, that's old-fashioned superstition. 
You can create your religion as you want. You can create your religion as you choose when you live in this land. And you know, the fact is that many people in the Christian church have bought it. They've capitulated. There are many people when one generation leads to the next, to the next, and pretty soon there's a generation that says, we don't really need to go to church anymore. We don't need to worship our God. We don't need to be faithful in that. God will bless us anyway. And there are a lot of people who are, who are saying, well, you know what? I've got friends. I went to school with people, and they're good people. They, they don't hurt anybody, and they don't do anything wrong, and um, they're fine. In fact, they make more money than I do. And they seem to be just as happy as, as I am. So, you know, I think I'm going to live the way that they live. They're not wrapped up in all kinds of church ministries, and they don't have to stand up on a, on a Sunday at church and get commissioned to volunteer their time to be, you know, they, they go to the beach on Sunday instead of going to church. And they seem to be pretty happy. There are many people who are buying into the untruths of the culture in which we live. And they're not taking God's word as the way of life, the way of joy, as a way of, of fulfillment. But they buy into the lie of the culture around us. No, they're not going to the temple of Baal. They're going to the contemporary equivalent or comparable form of non-Christian worship today. So God charges us with keeping the faith through the generations. There's a reason, there's a powerful reason why we read through that form for baptism and we're reminded what this is all about. And there's a reason why parents stand up here and they tell us what we already know. They believe in the one true God and they believe that the Bible is the word of God and yes, they are making a commitment to raise their children and to teach their children, not whatever happens to be the fad in the world today, but the truth of the word of God as the way of life and salvation. There's a reason why we stand together as a congregation and we say in this world in which we live, being a parent is a tremendous task and it's a tremendous responsibility and it's the primary responsibility of parents to raise their children, but they need help. And we're in this together and we support each other and we're going to teach or we're going to, we're going to participate together in the life of the family of God because we're all in it together to be the people of God and recognize that, that God has called us to be a distinct People. And we're going to pass that on from generation to generation, and we're going to realize that it's our great privilege to receive uh, with joy the children that God gives to us as a treasure. And we're in that together. And we know, starting out, there are no guarantees. We know that there are families who experience the ache and the pain of children who have turned their back on God and on Jesus and on the Holy Spirit and has said, no, I just want to live the way everybody else lives in the world around us. We need to support each other in prayer and keep that faith through the generations. We need to do what the Bible teaches us in terms of walking the fine line in the world but not of the world. God doesn't tell us to, to, you know, form a separate country, separate, um, form a distinct neighborhood, and put up walls and live in that neighborhood. We're in the world. And we're going to live side by side with people who don't share our Christian values. We're going to live in communities that don't share our Christian values. And we have to be in that world, but not of it. Not capitulating, not letting our mind be swayed to believe that, well, what we once believed in the Bible is no longer relevant for today. 
But we are called to be a light in that community and to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, these are Jesus' words in John 17, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. People of God, that's our challenge. To be led by the Holy Spirit, to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, to live in this land, to live in this culture, to live in this day and age, filled with the joy of Christ our Savior. Faithful to the word of God, recognizing the distinction between what is Christian and what is not, what is pleasing to God and what is not. And we are called to make that commitment. And so part of our worship this morning in the context of baptism is to ask, how are we doing? passing on from generation to generation those trusted truths of God's word. How are we doing as parents, as grandparents, as extended family, as, as the collective family of God in promoting that education? How are we doing in our ministries, our education program? How's our participation in the ministries of the church that, that help us to be prepared in this context to live as distinct children of God and not just beginning to mirror the people around us. How are we doing in terms of reaching out to the world around us and saying, God has a better way. God understands. God God knows your hurting heart. God knows your brokenness. Because you're not putting your trust where it ought to be put. You're not finding your purpose, your joy, and your reason for life where God expects it. Living for his glory and having that reassurance that you have that personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Israel went ballistic. Um, how are we to avoid going ballistic today? Well, it really means walking closely with our God. It means seeing the world that God opens and unfolds for us on a regular basis through his word, recognizing this is what pleases our holy God. It means being attuned to, to the deceptions of the world as compared to the truth of the word. It means living distinctly by the word and spirit of God so that we fulfill the promises that we make to our God. So where do children come from? Not just babies, but, but children of God. They, they come from families that embrace the love of covenant God and pass that on from generation to generation. Let's make that commitment to be faithful to the God who has been so gracious to us. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we pray open our eyes to see the challenges of the world in which we live. Help us to be true to you, to be faithful, to celebrate the life that you have given to us, the newness of life, the freedom of life to pass that on to our children as parents to children, as teachers to children, as a church to children. Father, help us to live in the beauty of the life you have created. In Jesus' name, amen.